everybody, and welcome to our free monthly lecture series here at the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. Um, before we get started, I would like to thank our sponsors for our community enrichment programming, which includes North Country Federal Savings Credit Union, m and Bank, and AARP Vermont. So thank you for sponsoring these programs for the community. Uh, today, uh, you are going to get a great lecture. You can already see on the screen a little bit about that. But first up, I want to announce some of the upcoming events that we have here at the museum. And you can also see these on our Facebook page, on the Seven Days Burlington Events Calendar, and on our website. Next weekend, we have a Home and Hearth reenactment event on Saturday, September 28th from 10 to 3 p.m where reenactors will be recreating everyday life in the 1780s and 90s in the historic Allen House. And on October 19th is our annual Flax Stravaganza, where reenactors are producing our, our homegrown flax crop and turning it into linen thread, doing all of these steps. And visitors can also join in on those steps if they like. Next month's lecture series is on October 20th. It is The Battle of Cedar Creek by Mike Souls, a Civil War historian. And that is also another free event you can attend. And on October 25th, we are going to have our very first Spooky Stories at the Homestead. It's on the Friday night before Halloween. The sun will go down, the moon will come up, and we'll take you on a candlelit tour of some of the scary stories of the past around our grounds and into the old Allen House. That will be a ticketed event, and you must purchase tickets in advance. Tickets are not yet live, but please keep an eye on our social media pages and our website for when those tickets go live. And then our last special um, event um, that happens right near the end of closing for the season is our book club meeting on November 10th, and the book being discussed is The Hornet's Nest by Jimmy Carter. That is, former President Jimmy Carter wrote a book set in the Revolutionary War time. It's a historical fiction novel. So uh, make sure to come to that. That will be an online Zoom or discussion um, about that book. OK. So I am going to hobble over to my chair in a minute. And um, one of our board members here at the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum is going to introduce our speaker. Uh, really quick, the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum, we are a small nonprofit museum. Um, other than our one and, a, one and a quarter paid staff, it is all volunteer run here. And so this board member is one of our amazing volunteers who dedicates their time to this museum. And uh, so please help me welcome um, Assistant Professor of History at St. Michael's College, Dr. Alexandra Garrett. <laughs> Um, so yeah, welcome. Thank you so much for coming today. We're really excited to have our lecture series happening, and the lecturer today is Mr. Jeffrey Skelly. So I'd like to introduce him to you. So Mr. Jeffrey Skelly um, is a senior elections analyst at 538, which is a data journalism website owned by ABC News. So you might have seen him before uh, in the past, or maybe in the near future, as like one of those talking heads on ABC News. So um, and it's mostly not. Uh, uh, hot air that he talks about, right? Uh, he actually has good things to say personally. So, all right, so he earned his uh, bachelor's degree at the University of Virginia in Spanish and history. He earned his master's degree in political science from James Madison University, and he has been at 538 for the past six years. Also, he is my husband. So, take it away, dear. Have a great lecture. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I've now achieved the uh, the life the life goal of having your own partner uh, introduce you at a thing. So, um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm very excited to come talk to you <clears throat> about what's happening in the 2024 election. Uh, we have some more folks coming in here, and um, you know, she mentioned that uh, Alexi mentioned that the name of my site, the site that I work for, is 538. And that's a very important number. Um, does anyone know what 538 is? The total of Correct. Yes, it's the total number of electoral votes in the Electoral College, which is the, uh, which is how we determine who wins the presidency in the United States. Um, uh, so I'm going to take us into what's 
going on, what's been happening um, in what has been a somewhat eventful presidential cycle, and also talk a bit about what's happening uh, in the race for the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House, uh, and give you some historical context at times, because that's like a favorite thing of mine, and I think it's also helpful for understanding what's happening, and also talk a little bit about polling and how it's very helpful, but also by no means is it perfect. Um, so gonna gonna dig into all of that and yes uh, here we have a a map of the electoral college based on sort of where the states are today and you're going to see this throughout where sort of the darker red something is the more republican it is the darker blue something is the more democratic leaning it is and um, if the, the lighter tinge means it's more competitive and if it's not colored at all it's probably a toss-up um, so anyway so you may remember all those eons ago uh, that there was uh, the 2024 presidential election looked to be a rematch uh, from the 2020 election between President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump. And so that seemed to be the way things were headed uh, for a very long time. Uh, and then there was this event that occurred on June 27th uh, where Biden Trump <clears throat> met in the earliest general election debate uh, that we've ever had in a presidential election. Uh, I guess the first one was in 1960, so let's not like extend this too far back, right? But uh, in terms of presidential election, general election debates, none had been held earlier than September before. Uh, so we had a late June debate. And the Biden campaign was hoping that that was going to sort of rejuvenate his campaign and shift the conversation. Well, it shifted the conversation all right. I don't think quite the way they expected um, because Biden's performance was viewed pretty universally as very poor. Uh, and that became the story, um, was whether, uh, you know, the 82-year-old Joe Biden was up to another four years uh, as president. And uh, in the aftermath of that, you started hearing voices on the Democratic side very quickly saying, like, maybe Biden really needs to step aside. Remember, Biden had no opposition, essentially no opposition. Apologies to Dean Phillips. Uh, and Marion Williamson, but essentially no opposition for, the, for the, the nomination on the Democratic side, which is typical. Incumbent presidents rarely have serious opposition for renomination because they're generally well-liked by the, their own people in their party, and that's more true than ever now because both parties are, I mean, the parties are very polarized. Most Democrats are toward the left, most Republicans toward the right, and you don't have, you know, years ago you might have had a situation where there was like, a really clear like conservative democratic wing arguing with like the more liberal part of the party but like now because the parties are very ideologically cohesive uh, that is less likely to happen so you're going to mostly have the parties rallying to whomever is their party leader so understandably biden didn't really have much opposition the problem was that we knew from polling that a lot of people weren't sure he was up to running for another four years uh, and that there were a lot of Democrats who even said this, uh, even though they still liked Biden, they approved of his performance, generally speaking, as president, uh, and had a favorable opinion of him. But if you ask them if they sh he should be the nominee in the election, eh, it was like a 50-50, 60-40 yes kind of proposition in a lot of polling. And this is before the June 27th debate. Well, after the June 27th debate, suddenly you have this conversation about Maybe Biden needs to drop out. You have polling numbers showing majorities of Democrats even saying that Biden should step aside. You have notable members of the party, including members of the U.S. House and eventually the U.S. Senate, coming out and saying maybe Biden needs to consider stepping aside. And uh, in the immediate aftermath of the debate, as this polling average up on the screen shows, uh, you went from kind of a roughly 50-50 race or 42-42 race 41-41 uh, race to Trump getting out to a larger lead. And so that, of course, did not uh, make any of the Democrats feel better about the situation and only really, I think, encouraged the conversation about the idea of Biden dropping out. And he did, uh, which was, uh, I'll talk about it a little bit, but was a uh, rather remarkable event in the political history of the United States. This is an extremely rare event. Uh, and uh, he stepped aside, uh, which caused a reset. And to put in context about how kind of rare this is, uh, so, so Joe Biden drops his 2024 re-election bid. He's the first presumptive nominee. So this is a term the, the media likes to use. Um, and as a member of the media, I, I, I use it often. Essentially, the presumptive nominee is when somebody through the primary process has essentially clinched the nomination. They've got enough delegates. 
you know, it might in in Trump, in Biden's case, in Trump's case, in the presidential primaries, they both essentially got a, to a majority of the overall delegates at their national party conventions by mid March or so. So that's about as early as you're going to get it too. So they both clinched it. It was a it was foregone conclusion that at the convention Joe Biden was going to be renominated. And yet, despite this, he ended up dropping out and saying, I actually don't want to, be, to keep running, and I don't want to accept the nomination of my party, even though I have already clinched it. That has never happened. Uh, and so we've had the modern presidential pro, uh, primary process since the 1970s. Uh, before that, the convention was really more the usual decider of things. Uh, it was, it's more complicated than that. But really, we've, we're running about 50 years here of modern presidential primaries where people vote, and those votes uh, uh, essentially assign, allocate delegates to the candidates, and those delegates are the people who vote at the convention. And you go to the convention, and usually things are pretty much done and dusted. Everybody knows who won by the time you get to the convention. Uh, so the decision point is really in that earlier primary process rather than on the convention floor. So in that time, we had never had somebody who had clinched the nomination drop out before, before being officially nominated. Uh, and so Biden is... It was history. Uh, no, this has never happened before. He isn't the first president to drop a re-election bid, however. And I have three other people up on the uh, slide there who, um, this, it, it's a little interesting, and it's just a point of comparison that usually events are not unprecedented. Now, the aspect of him being the first presumptive nominee to drop out is unprecedented, but other presidents have started to run for re-election and dropped out before. So uh, going way back... Uh, we have John Tyler, who I called him a pseudo Whig up there. The party system uh, of the 1830s and 40s is uh, not terribly straightforward, but you basically had the Democrats and the Whigs. And um, the Whigs, uh, Tyler was a Whig basically because he was too much of a Democrat for the Democrats. That's like a simplistic way of putting it, but he like disagreed with the own people of his party so much that he ended up siding with the Whigs and became a Whig kind of by default because that was the opposition. And he gets put on the William Henry, William Henry Harrison ticket in the 1840 election as the vice presidential nominee, trying to basically bring together all sort of anti-Barton Van Buren forces. And they succeed, but then William Henry Harrison dies a month into his term. Uh, as president. And John Tyler, who really does not believe in any of the Whig program politically, uh, is suddenly president. And so the Whigs have control of government and are like, we're going to get to do all kinds of stuff that we've been wanting to do. And no, because John Tyler is going to veto everything they try to do, uh, or basically say no to a whole bunch of things that they try to do uh, as, as president. And the Whigs essentially kick him out of the party. They're like, we're not going to renominate you in 1844. The Demo so Tyler wants to be the Democratic nominee instead this time around uh, in 1844, but the Democrats are like, no, we, we don't want you either. So he initially runs as an independent, uh, and he actually mounts a campaign for a while. I mean, mounting a campaign then versus mounting one now is a little bit different of an, a different animal, but it's, he was still actively seeking the presidency until August 1844. He drops out, and he endorses uh, James K. Polk, who was the Democratic nominee, and Polk goes on to very narrowly defeat Henry Clay in the 1844 election. Uh, so John Tyler was sort of the, the original dropout uh, after actively running. Fast forward a little over 100 years, and you get Harry Truman, came into office after Franklin Roosevelt died at the beginning of his fourth term uh, in 1945. He, Truman has become vice president, sort of famously, it's like, who's that guy? Uh, becomes vice president, uh, having been a U.S. senator, and uh, didn't even know about like the Manhattan Project. They're like, oh, by the way, we have this thing going on um, that's kind of important. Uh, anyway, Truman, Truman runs for election and wins in 1948, somewhat unexpectedly. He was trailing in the polls throughout. Uh, famously, there's the famous picture of him holding up the Chicago Tribune that says, like, Dewey wins, Thomas Dewey, the Republican nominee, but Truman won. Um, the Tribune screwed that up. And uh, then Truman gets pretty unpopular. Uh, the economy's not doing great. The Korean War is not going that well. People are very dissatisfied. But he looks like he might run again in 1952. Uh, and so in the New Hampshire primary that March in 1952, he faces uh, Estes Kefauver, who is a U.S. senator from Tennessee. And Kefauver beats him. And Truman is like, well, I wasn't even that seriously campaigning yet. And Gosh, that's not a good sign. So he then formally says, I'm not running. 
I'm out. I'm not actually going to continue to to seek another term. And something similar happened 16 years later when Lyndon Johnson, unpopular, well, he's not that unpopular, uh, his, but his popularity has been waning uh, by the time you get to 1968 because of sort of the, the Vietnam looms is a massive issue, the Vietnam War, um, although I think it's easier to think it was un more unpopular than we think now. Um, we, I think everybody kind of assumes it was already super unpopular by then, but it was a lot more uh, contested uh, as, a, as a thing publicly. But the point is it is becoming more and more unpopular, and increasingly within his own party, the Democratic Party, there is opposition to his war policies. And uh, he gets challenged by Minnesota Senator Eugene McCarthy, not to be confused with Joe McCarthy from next door in Wisconsin, who had died 11 years earlier. Uh, but Eugene McCarthy challenges him in New Hampshire and only narrowly loses to Johnson, who was actually a write-in candidate, that they often forget to mention that part. Uh, but he only narrowly wins the New Hampshire primary and is like, ooh, this is not, this is not good. Thanks for, this, this could be actually kind of tough. A lot of people in my party don't want this. And he says, I, I shall not seek and I will not, uh, nor will I accept the nomination of my party at the end of March 1968 in a famous speech to the country. Uh, and so those are some prior examples. Um, obviously, when this sort of thing happens, it's uh, kind of a, uh, a roiling event. It's a rare event. Um, obviously, Biden's timing of dropping out as the presumptive nominee in late July of the election year was uh, particularly notable, um, and, and for a major party nominee to not to, to drop out that late, uh, definitely threw things for a loop. But obviously what happened is that Kamala Harris, the vice president of the United States, took over. Um, and I, I think it's worth noting that uh, the vice president has one job, <laughs> like constitutionally and politically, which is if something happens to the president, the, the vice president comes in. So it was always uh, the moment that it became possible that Biden actually might drop out it was pretty much a certainty that Harris was going to be who the Democrats turned to. And there were a lot of stories about like, oh my gosh, the Democrats might have a contested convention. But anyone who knew anything knew that that was never gonna happen. Uh, it was going to be Harris all the way. She's the vice president, the party was going to move to her. She was the, the clear alternative. Um, so fulfilling that duty, she is now the Democratic Party's nominee. And her entry into the race uh, was very interesting. Um, it very immediately energized Democrats and some other voters who wanted to oppose Donald Trump. And so just as to exemplify this, just fundraising as an example, uh, by, so Harris took over Biden's campaign committee. So it's like all together. Um, and if you include sort of all the things, fundraising is a bit of a, a mess to explain, but if you think of the constellation of democratic fundraising operations, whether it's the Biden, now Harris campaign, or the Democratic National Committee, or joint fundraising committees, they raised $310 million in July, but more than $200 million of that came in the last, like, fourth of the month when Harris had taken over. A lot of uh, just a sign of energy uh, on the Democratic side of the aisle in the, with Biden dropping out, and I think that it would kind of signal that there was a group of Democrats, and we saw this in polls, saying, like, maybe Biden should drop out. We're looking for a reason to get excited about supporting a candidate and opposing Donald Trump. And before Harris, more of them were saying, look, I'm just opposing Donald Trump. That's why I'm supporting Joe Biden. Once Harris came in, you saw an increase in the share of people saying, I'm supporting the Democratic nominee because I support that candidate, not just because I oppose Donald Trump. Um, and by comparison, Trump and the constellation, to use that word again, of Republican fundraising outlets raised $140 million in July. So that is a very, very large differential for a single month of fundraising in, in American politics because American politics is just, uh, there's, there's so much money in it that uh, there is a question of diminishing returns at a certain point. Uh, but nonetheless, you don't usually see that kind of uh, disproportional uh, uh, makeup of fundraising between the two parties. And of course, there was also a notable shift in the polls. So you may recall from the earlier slide, <clears throat> that Joe Biden was trailing by about three percentage points in national polls when he dropped out. And now Harris is ahead by a little less than three percentage points. And you can see sort of from when she comes in, right, in uh, late July, uh, she, her lead, she kind of developed a bit of a lead, got a little bit of sort of a, there was so much focus, obviously, on this major event of someone coming in that in some ways they talk about like getting a bounce in your polls after a convention. Harris sort of got hers before the convention because 
she essentially had a couple weeks there of the story only being about her, all this focus on her candidacy and stepping in for Biden, a lot of focus on Tim Walz as her vice presidential pick, a lot of just focus on Kamala Harris as this new political entity by herself, separate from Biden, separate from being his, just his vice president, and she gained in the polls. Uh, and she has largely held that lead, uh, even as, and I'll talk about him a little bit, but Robert Kennedy, you may remember him, Robert Kennedy Jr., let me specify, he, uh, he dropped out uh, in late August and endorsed Donald Trump. Um, but at this point, uh, nationally, Harris is up by two and a half or so percentage points. And um, that is a clear change. Like, you know, for all the talk about polling and how helpful it is, I think the fact that you had Biden clearly trailing and now Harris leading. Now, this does not mean Harris is going to win. Uh, it's more complicated than that. We'll talk about the Electoral College here in a minute. But I think that you'll have the same poll that had Biden trailing by like six or five or whatever, showing them tied, like her and Trump tied, you know, a month or two later, is indicative of a changed political environment. Something has clearly changed. Um, and part of that is that Harris has rallied some parts of the Democratic coalition that were flagging under Biden. Uh, young voters, voters of color in particular, were things where Biden was way undershooting where you would expect a Democratic candidate to be. And Harris has shorn those up a whole bunch more while mostly keeping support among other groups where Biden had it or, or even slightly better. Um, and that has been enough for her to gain a small lead nationally. Now, it might not be enough to win, though, because, of course, in the Electoral College, uh, we decide things based on state by state. Now, those, uh, sorry, I think uh, uh, parentheses got, I think my parentheses, it looked bright when I loaded it up, but it got slightly off there, so sorry about that. Um, the, uh, these are the sort of eight most important swing states and their margins right now in the polls, in, our, in 538's polling average. Um, and in parentheses there, uh, before it decided to drop a line, uh, is the number of electoral votes for that state. So. In the Electoral College, we have 538 electoral votes. To win the presidency, you need to win enough states worth 270, so an outright majority, uh, to win the presidency. If it's a 269, or if no one has a majority, let's just put it that way. These days, that would mean probably a 269-269 tie, which could happen, very unlikely, but could happen. Uh, that you, you would have a contingent election um, under the 12th Amendment of the US Constitution, and the House would vote on uh, vote on, on who would win, um, and technically the House has to take the top three electoral vote winners under consideration. This has happened exactly one time, and that was in 1824. Uh, but this time around, we would only expect two electoral vote winners in all likelihood. Um, and so you would have each individual state, their delegation in the U.S. House of Representatives cast one vote. So California gets one vote, Wyoming gets one vote, Vermont gets one vote. And it's just, what does the delegation collectively do? Um, so like you would expect a blue state like California to cast one vote for Harris. Um, you would expect Vermont's one vote, <laughs> Becca Ballant, to vote for Harris. Um, however, based on the makeup of the House, there's a pretty decent chance that under those circumstances, a 269-269 tie, that Trump would win. Because uh, I think he would be most likely to get to 26 states, a majority of the 50 states, um, uh, to win. Uh, You'd also have some states where they're literally tied and they can't break a tie. There's like, there'll be four members, two Republicans, two Democrats, and neither is, no one's willing to break. And so the state doesn't even cast a vote. Anyway, let's really hope that doesn't happen because that would be really hectic. Um, anyway, swing states. All of these states uh, are, are critically important to the election outcome, particularly Pennsylvania, which I will continue to talk about as we go on here. But what I really want to stress here is that you've got some states that are the, the most competitive states, all of these but Florida, I essentially have colored as a toss-up in, in the map, maps that I'm using in this, in this uh, program, um, because a lead of inside of three points is, uh, you should not take that to the bank. I mean, honestly, Florida is still very much in play. I included it there because it is so large, 30 electoral votes. Uh, it's the third largest state um, in terms of electoral votes after California and Texas. And so it's very important and if Harris can make that more competitive, that would be helpful to her. 
Uh, but Trump does have a somewhat larger lead there, four points than, than in some of the other states. But all these other states, a lead inside of three, leads inside of one, you know, for Pennsylvania, Nevada, North Carolina, Arizona, Georgia, is extremely tight. Uh, and, and way inside sort of a cone of uncertainty about what could happen on election day in those places. Um, and uh, it's, it's, I think, just indicative of an extremely close election and one where, if I just flip back quickly to the national polling average, you know, if we decided to vote based on a national popular vote, uh, Harris would be a slightly bigger favorite, but under the electoral college system, it's basically a coin flip, uh, more or less. Um, I think you could give Harris a very slight edge. Uh, in fact, uh, our forecast model at 538, which essentially takes into account the polls at the state level, to some extent also brings in polls at the national level, but you, really more as an adjustment for what's happening at the state level when you don't have new state polls. And economic fundamentals, so like how are people feeling about the economy, past voting history, because look, the odds are that the st most states will vote very similarly to how they voted four years ago. Uh, and, and so kind of taking all of this stuff into account, we currently give Harris the slimmest of edges. I mean, 58 times out of 100 is essentially a coin flip uh, to, to win the election. So like it is now, to be clear, if we were running this thing with Biden right now, it would at the very least be flipped. And Trump would probably be somewhere in the 60s or something. Um, so I think from the perspective of where the race is, uh, uh, Trump is in a worse position than he'd be if he were still running against Biden. However, he still could certainly win. Like this, this race, you know, flip a coin a few times and see what happens. Um, so it's, it's a very tight race. So I'm going to talk about the Electoral College a little more in depth here. So we talked about the swing states. Most of them are the ones in gray there, or I'm not even sure how that color is showing up there, but uh, mauve or something, I don't know. Um, uh, those are the, the key swing states, the ones that are most competitive. And again, remember, sort of the darker blue, the more Democratic leaning, the darker red, the more Republican leaning. And um, this is based on uh, the polls and our election, our election forecast. And so I've sort of laid it out here to sort of do a little, little back of the envelope math with you. So right now, Harris has at least a somewhat clear edge in states worth 226 electoral votes. And Trump has an edge in states worth 219 electoral votes. Um, you will notice, and this is going to become important in a second, there are also two states that have split electoral votes. And that's because Nebraska and Maine, 48 states give their electoral votes, all of their electoral votes, to the winner statewide. So winner take all. Nebraska and Maine do not do that. They give two electoral votes to the, the statewide winner in their states, and then they split the others up by the winner of each individual congressional district in the state. So in Nebraska's case, there are three congressional districts. If you win all th three of them, you get three. But if you win two of them, you get two, and the other person gets one. And Maine has two congressional districts, uh, uh, so two other votes. So Maine, four total, Nebraska, five total, but they can be split. And they were split in 2020, in fact. Um, uh, the same way that they are currently more likely than not going to go, which involved Trump winning the somewhat Republican-leaning second congressional district in Maine, even while Harris is favored to carry Maine overall and the much more liberal Portland-based uh, first district um, in Maine, so that you would end up with a 3-1 split in Maine in favor of Harris. And in Nebraska, the second congressional district around Omaha, hopefully both both of the highly contested districts are the second. So just remember the second district in those states. Uh, the second district in Omaha um, does have a Republican representative, but is slightly Democratic leaning overall. And uh, Biden did carry it in 2020. Obama carried it in 2008. Uh, so it very well might vote for Harris. And you could end up with uh, Trump getting four electoral votes out of Nebraska, two statewide, two from the more conservative districts, but then that Omaha-based seat actually going for Harris. And that one, those, each of those one votes is very important to the Electoral College math. So look, you're trying to get to 270 votes, right? So if you're Harris and you have 226 electoral votes, your clearest path and the one that actually best matches her uh, polling in the swing states, she has a 2.7 point lead in Wisconsin, one and a half in Michigan, just shy of a point in Pennsylvania. Again, too small to be reliable, but if that's an indication of what her best path is, 
Winning those three states, if she's at 226 right now, adds 44 electoral votes, gets you right to 270. If you're Donald Trump, on the other hand, and you're at 219, and again, you have that main second congressional district in your, in your pocket, just like Harris has the second in this, just based on what we know right now, like this could change to be clear, but based on what we just know right now, and you're Trump and you're at 219, well, if you get Georgia, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania, you get right to 270. Um, so that, I think, really sort of speaks to the closeness of the election and why also Pennsylvania is the most important state in the election. Uh, it is the Keystone State, and it is appropriately named for this election because it is the most likely state to be what we call the tipping point state, the state that decides who gets 270 or more. Um, it is the most likely in our, in our forecast model. It's like, I think it's about a fifth of I mean, it varies from, from run to run, but it's like roughly a fifth of the cases. It's the one that puts somebody over the top. Um, so it is the most likely state to decide things. Um, that is not to say that you could not, like it is possible to say like a fifth of cases is, that means four out of five cases. There's some other state that's doing that. So there are other instances where it is quite possible Pennsylvania won't be the tipping point state, but both campaigns are viewing it as basically the most important state uh, in the Electoral College. And um, it's very close, as I said, polling average, Harris up by maybe a point. So very, very, very close, well within range for polling error, error either way to make that wider for Harris or a Trump win or, or what have you. Um, I'll also mention that Nevada and Arizona are out there. Um, also important if things don't go quite as we expect, if the polls are slightly more, like if, if things don't align quite the way they, they worked out in 2020 in terms of the order of states, uh, a state like Nevada and Arizona, those could be crucial to getting to 270 as well. Um, but again, getting back to like if Harris is at 226 because she has that Nebraska district and Trump's at 219 because they has that main district, you can see why that one vote's very important because if they didn't get that vote in these scenarios I'm laying out, they'd be at 269 and you could have the 269-269 tie. So the, uh, those congressional district electoral votes are very important. And just in case you don't know, the total number of electoral votes each state has are based on the two senators. So every, every state gets two senators in the, in the US Congress and the number of representatives it has in the US House of Representatives. So um, Vermont, two senators, one representative, Vermont has three electoral votes. Then there's also D.C., which because of the 23rd Amendment to the Constitution has three electoral votes in presidential elections, so it has some say. It has no representation in Congress, but it has some say in uh, presidential elections. So that's how we ended up with 538. They may maybe didn't think that through all the way because uh, it would probably been more helpful to have an odd number so you wouldn't have ties, but or you'd be less likely to have ties. But they uh, look, there are a lot of states in this country that have an even number of members of, like, their lower house in their in their state legislature. And so there's always a chance that they could have a tie and have to sort out things, you know, with a power sharing agreement or something. So um, people didn't maybe think that through all the way. But, uh, but, but nonetheless, that's how you get the number of electoral votes for each state and why we have 538. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about like the polls, you know, there could be polling error, there could be uh, things could things could happen. Look, like there's always some degree of polling error. Like polls are never like exact. That just does not happen as a general rule, um, and it makes sense. I mean, you're taking a survey. There's a margin of error in that survey. Uh, generally speaking, the way it usually works is that uh, uh, the way it's usually reported is they'll say like, uh, "There's a margin of error of three points." And if it's a race where, let's say, Harris is up 48, 47 in that poll, that means she could have anywhere between 45 and 51 percent. So 48, either way, three points. And if Trump's at 47, either way, three points, so 50 to 44. Now it's more likely that he's closer to that 47 mark. But the whole thing is that it's based on probability and the idea that um, uh, there, there is a chance that it falls outside of that range. Um, in one out of 20 cases, generally, is how they, how they do that. But the point is that like, there can be error. And sometimes there's error that's not survey error. There's error because like, sometimes it's tough to reach people. Um, one of the great challenges uh, for pollsters in recent years has been uh, particularly contacting voters who were more likely to support Trump 
but less likely to answer polls. Now, pollsters have tried to deal with this in various ways, uh, use new methods of contacting people. Um, a lot more pollsters use multiple modes, mode being like phone, text, internet, various various means of trying to reach out, even mail. Uh, one thing that a lot of pollsters do now is they'll try to have like a, a universe of people that is representative of the country, but it's like a smaller universe. It's like 10,000, 8,000 people, panelists that they've recruited randomly. So you still get that randomness. And then they try to randomly select from that random group, but they know that they're on this panel and therefore maybe more likely to answer because they've been recruited for the panel. So like pollsters are taking different steps to try to address the challenges that they faced um, because in 2020 and 2016, um, there was a little bit more polling error than we saw in 2012, for instance, or, or 2008. Um, but on the whole, just to, to show there uh, in that second bullet point, on average from 2000 to 2020, there was an average of about four points in margin of error in the polls. Um, and now that's national polls, that's states, state polls. This is for just president, just president, presidential elections. Um, four points is actually not that bad. It's worse for other things like Senate, House. But obviously, four points could matter a great deal uh, in a uh, in like a key swing state. You know, if your margins are uh, 2.7, 1.5, uh, four points could, could matter a great deal. Um, and the thing is, it can also vary a lot. Um, for instance, in 2020, the polls were pretty good in Arizona and Georgia. They were like pretty close to spot on. However, they definitely undershot Trump quite notably in a place like Wisconsin. It ended up being much closer than it looked like. And that could get a lot of certain demographic facts about the state, different challenges of taking a, a, a poll in that state. Like some states, it may be easier for a pollster to figure out, uh, to weight their sample in a way that they think gets a more accurate picture of the partisan makeup of the electorate because they have voter registration by party in that state. But some states don't have that, and that might make it more challenging to make sure that you're, you're waiting to – it gives you something else to adjust your sample to. But some states don't register by party, including like Vermont. So that would be something you can't do as a part of your waiting process and trying to make your sample look more like the general population that you expect to show up and vote. Now, I also mentioned the word here, polling bias. Now, this is not bias in the sense of like, oh, that person's biased because they support so and so. This is just a technical term for how did the polls perform relative to the actual outcome? Were they more Democratic leaning or more Republican leaning? And on average, in presidential polling, 2000 to 2020, averaged about a point lean toward the Democrats. So not overall, not a lot of bias um, either way. But... In 2016 to 2020, there was a clearer uh, bias toward the Democrats. D, uh, it was about three points in 2016, about four points in 2020, um, in terms of sort of exaggerating the, ex the, the Democratic performance as it played out. But in 2012, it was three points more Republican. Uh, so polls thought Mitt Romney was going to do better than he did against Barack Obama. And that kind of speaks to the fact that we can talk about, like, okay, we're in the Trump era. era 2016, 2020, Trump was on the ballot, and we had this clearly notable error and bias. The thing is, if you tried to use the last presidential cycle to predict the error or bias in the next presidential cycle, it would be a, it would be a very bad bet. The casinos would love you for making that bet over and over again. So it's been a very bad predictor. And while 2016 and 2020 align, if you take like the longer view of polls, it is not a consistent thing. It's because pollsters are constantly adjusting. They're trying to do a better job. They don't want that to happen. They want to be as close as they can to the mark. And so that means you're kind of like, it's a moving target. Also, you know, the nature of the candidates, um, how they appeal, who they appeal to, um, it's, it just is going to vary from cycle to cycle. And so just because 2016 and 2020 were a certain way doesn't mean that 2024 is going to match it. Does it mean that, I, I think we have to realistically say it is possible that you could see an error again that that is more like it turns out that Trump is doing better than we thought. Um, I think, you know, after 2016 and 2020, that you have to be realistic about that. That could be a possibility again. However, knowing that pollsters are trying to adjust for this reality and have been very frustrated by the last two election cycles in their efforts to try to, to deal with, with the, the 
the, the complexities of trying to get a, a pretty accurate gauge of public opinion, um, it is very possible that they will be much closer to the mark this time around, or that Harris will even be undershot. So I think it's important to understand that like the polls are useful. Like there's a pretty good chance that Harris will win the popular vote. Like I would say that that's like a reasonably good chance. But the thing is, if she wins the popular vote by like a half point, she's probably going to lose the election just because of what we know about the Electoral College right now. The sw key swing states are just a bit to the right of the country as a whole. Um, and so that would probably mean that, that Trump would win. At the same time, maybe Harris wins by four and wins the key swing states or enough to get over you know, 270 or more. Uh, so this is just to sort of bring in the, like, there's a lot of uncertainty here. Um, and that's why I kind of view the election as a coin flip. Now, just because uh, I think it's worth mentioning, um, because it seemed like it was going to be a bigger thing earlier in the election cycle, and it still is worth mentioning, third parties. Um, so most people going to the polls are going to vote Democratic or Republican for president. And they're especially going to probably vote Democratic or Republican down ballot because there will be fewer third party candidates running for Senate and House than there are for president. Interestingly, in some states, it is easier to get on the ballot as a presidential candidate for a third party than to get on the ballot as a House candidate, um, but I digress. Uh, RFK Jr., obviously, on the far right there, was sort of the most notable uh, member of this group of sort of notable fourth, uh, third party candidates. What I have here is the list of sort of the, the eight states I was talking about earlier, the key swing states, and whether or not right now, and this could change because some of these are actually being contested in court right now um, by uh, for various reasons about ballot access, whether or not these individuals are on the ballot. And I think the thought process is that RFK Jr., who was actually previously on the ballot in most of these places, has successfully gotten off the ballot in some of them because he's no longer running and he endorsed Trump. And so his thought process now is that I don't want to hurt Trump. So he has been trying to get off the ballot in some places, uh, remove his name. In some states, uh, that has not happened. Michigan, I think their Supreme Court just shot that down, actually, and said he had to stay on. Um, anyway, there's like a whole bunch of litigation happening right now over all of these, in fact. Um, and uh, there is some thought that Jill Stein is the Green Party nominee, and Cornell West, who is definitely a progressive, left-leaning, independent candidate, that they, if you're thinking about, there's this term that gets thrown around like someone being a spoiler, someone spoiling the election for somebody. It's a little simplistic because here's the thing, a lot of the people who would vote third party would never vote for the major party candidates in the first place. It's not a given that every Green Party voter would vote Democratic. That's just not, you can do that math, and some Hillary Clinton supporters did that in 2016, getting mad about Jill Stein, but Jill Stein did not cost Hillary Clinton the 2016 election. Um, that, that there was one, Michigan you could have had a conversation about in that election, but none of the others um, where it was really close to Jill Stein matter uh, to the outcome. Um, and that Michigan would not have been enough for Clinton anyway. Uh, so, but there is some thought that it, like Stein or West gets just enough of the vote, you know, maybe those, some of those votes would have gone to Harris, and that's probably true, some of them. And so that's where they come in. Chase Oliver is the Libertarian candidate. There are some Libertarian voters out there. In fact, the Libertarians are basically the, the most, outside of Vermont at least, the, the most uh, popular third party in the country. Um, Vermont, we're, we're fun. We're like the only one with a really fully functioning third party with the progressives here. Um, but the Libertarians have a little more national pull and have had a tendency to pull in some more right-leaning voters um, who may not be comfortable with Donald Trump, for instance. Um, we saw that to some extent in 2016 with Gary Johnson. Um, and so Oliver's on the ballot everywhere because the Libertarians are sort of the strongest, most well-positioned third party. He's on the ballot in, in all of these key states. Uh, but it's unlikely that these candidates are going to decide the election, particularly because RFK Jr. is no longer around. And RFK Jr. was drawing actual meaningful support in national polls. Um, he was at 9%, 10% in a lot of polls when Biden dropped out. But then his support kind of halved to about 4 or 5% uh, once Harris came into the race, um, which you know, could be indicative of some voters who were not happy with Biden being there saying like, oh, now there's somebody I actually might support. Um, although Kennedy supporters, to be clear, were kind of a mixed bag on which of the major party candidates they preferred. And Trump did very slightly better overall once you uh, got rid of Kennedy uh, in, in polls. But it's 
we, we did a study on this where you, you looked at polls that asked a head-to-head -head version of the question, so Trump versus Harris, and then a version of the question that had Trump, Harris, and Kennedy. And then you compared how the margins shifted um, between those two questions in the same poll. So it would be you know, the same poll, so that gives you kind of the, you're working with the same group of people in terms of that were being sampled. And Trump gained 0.2 percentage points in margin when you removed Kennedy. Uh, that, to give, put it in perspective, is the average amount that our polling average nationally moves every day. Um, so to say the least, Kennedy leaving may help Trump very finely at the margins, but it's unlikely to have decided the election in some way. Um, but now the fact that he's not on the ballot means that once again, third party candidates are probably not going to win too much of the election, uh, too much of the popular vote. Um, you know, they almost all the major party candidates, Democrat plus Republican, almost always win 95 percent or more. 2016 was a rare instance where the, all the third parties together and write in votes got six percent. Um, and that was with Trump versus Clinton. But then we saw that fall back to was like two or three uh, percent in 2020, and I think it'll probably be something closer to that range once again. Now, there's also a whole bunch of other elections happening below the presidential race um, that are important because in order to govern, especially because things are so very polarized, it helps if your party has control of all levers of power uh, in Congress and the presidency together. Because if there's divided government, you are far less likely to get anything done. Uh, that you want to get done. So Senate, 100 seats, each state has two senators, and of those, uh, 34 of those seats are up. Um, for election in 2024, uh, the Senate split into three classes, so roughly a third of the Senate is up every two years because they have six-year staggered terms, and so you only end up with a third of the Senate up regularly uh, every two years. Um, currently, the Democrats have the narrowest of margins in the Senate. They have 51 overall in their caucus. That includes four independents. Um, it used to be just the two independents. You had Bernie Sanders, of course, from Vermont. Uh, you had Angus King from Maine. And then you had Kirsten Sinema leave the Democratic Party from Arizona, but still caucus with them. And then Joe Manchin, uh, who is not running for re-election, um, recently switched his party registration to independent, and so is technically an independent now but is still caucusing with the Democrats. So just for simple math, it's 51-49 in favor of the Democrats after the 2022 midterms. And so to shift control, that means Republicans, so for the parties to shift control in the Senate, you would need Republicans to gain one seat and win the presidency. So they have the tie-breaking vote. The vice president is the tiebreaker in a 50-50 Senate. Or two seats outright. So it would be 51-49 or more for the Republicans. And then in the House, also extremely narrow in terms of the margins here, Republicans have a 221 to 214 seat edge in the House. And so that means Democrats need a net gain of four seats to go from 214 to 218, which would give them the narrowest of majorities in a 435 seat House. So yeah, Congress is really, really tight uh, as well. So yeah, just close all around. Um, <laughs> Um, so, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Senate first, and then I'll talk briefly about the House. I'm not going to go into all 435 seats. Don't worry. Don't worry. We won't be here till 10 o'clock. Um, if I could do it by 10 o'clock, it'd probably be like 2 in the morning. Um, uh, all right. So this is, these are the seats that are up for Senate. And so I mentioned only about a third are up every two years. So there are 33 seats that are up regularly, and then there's a special election for a Nebraska seat. So we have 34 total seats up. This happens to be a group of seats that the Democrats control 23 of them, um, and, and that's including independents who caucus with them, because I've colored Maine and Vermont in blue, even though it's Angus King and Bernie Sanders, and then also Arizona, Kirsten Sinema, and Joe Manchin, West Virginia. So the four independents who caucus with the Democrats, but just consider them Democratic-held seats for the purposes of control. Democrats are very much on the defensive. This is a group of seats where they have done very well. They, this is the same class of seats that were elected in 2018, which was a good year for Democrats, 2012, which was a relatively good year for Democrats, 2006, which was a very good year for Democrats. So that can build over time if the same party keeps doing well in the same sort of group of seats that are up every six years, um, where you can build to the point where maybe you're holding on to some seats that are becoming more difficult to retain because maybe part politics has shifted some since then. So for instance, of this group of seats, uh, there are uh, three that Donald Trump carried in 2020 and 2016 that Democrats are defending. So the blue seats, West Virginia, Ohio, and Montana. And those are the three seats that are sort of viewed as the most important Senate seats on the Senate map uh, this cycle 
um, the most competitive, the ones that were most likely to be contested and potentially flipped by either part by by Republicans in this case and Democrats trying to hold on to them. So Democrats are very much on the defensive because Trump won Ohio by about eight percentage points in 2020, but Montana and West Virginia was a lot more, and particularly West Virginia, where Joe Manchin was essentially a unicorn as a Democrat still in office in West Virginia. Um, uh, so those were going to be much more difficult to hold on to. And that probably helps explain why Manchin decided to retire. He's like, eh, I'm probably going to lose, so I'm not going to run again. Um, but John Tester, the incumbent Democrat in Montana, is running for re-election, but he's in a really tough fight there. And then Sherrod Brown, the incumbent senator in Ohio, is a Democrat, also seeking re-election. Um, and so this is, this is uh, ratings of those various seats based on um, – there are a number of political handicappers out there. Um, think about like horse racing handicappers, people putting odds on things essentially. And uh, uh, one of them is my old place of work, the University of Virginia Center for Politics. It's also the Cook Political Report, Inside Elections. Those are the ones that I used. Um, and 270 to win has these nice maps, which you can customize. So that's why I've been using those throughout. Um, currently, if you look, so we were talking about Montana, Ohio, and West Virginia. Well. West Virginia is going Republican. It's a done deal. Manchin retiring. He was the o Manchin was the only Democrat on earth who could hold that seat for Democrats. Uh, and he decided not to even try because he was probably going to lose. And so he retired. And so he's not going to be on the ballot this November. And Jim Justice, the sitting governor there, who's Republican, very popular in West Virginia, is going to almost certainly win that election. So there you go. That gets Republicans to 50-50 with the VP colored there in gray because we don't know who the vice president's going to be. Um, so that gets you to 50-50 right there, not knowing the outcome of the presidential election. Montana, you'll notice it's kind of a light pink. It's because it probably leans Republican now, based on what we're seeing in the polls there. Tim Sheehy, the Republican nominee, uh, is generally leading John Tester, the Democratic incumbent, by a few points. It is close. Um, I don't think anyone is writing Tester off, but I think an honest reading of the race is that Tester is an underdog at this point to hold on to his seat um, after three terms. Uh, getting a fourth is going to be really difficult. And then in Ohio, it is a toss-up. Uh, Sherrod Brown looks to be in a better position relative to Tester, uh, in part because Ohio is not as red as Montana is, um, but also because Bernie Moreno, the Republican nominee who's running against Tester, he's had some various scandals and has Brown has massively outraised him in terms of fundraising. Um, but at the end of the day, Moreno could still end up winning if Trump is carrying the state by eight points again. I mean, that could be enough uh, to get Moreno over the, over the line because at the end of the day, most people are going to vote for the same party up and down the ticket. So for someone like Tester, if Trump is carrying Montana by like 18 percentage points, that means he needs to find a really large group of people to vote for Trump and vote for him. And that's increasingly difficult to do in our, in our politics today. For Brown, smaller number. If Trump is carrying it by eight, he's like half that margin difference to split their ticket. That could happen. It's not outside the realm. And so that's why it's kind of a toss-up race. Tester's in a tougher spot, although I will say small states are interesting. Uh, you can have a little bit more of a personal brand and perhaps uh, kind of outshine the partisan lean of your state a little bit uh, to, to win. Um, so, I mean, that's part of how Tester got there in the first place, even though Montana was, has, has always been a, or has mostly been a Republican-leaning state in modern times. Um, it used to be a very Democratic state uh, in, like, New Deal days. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it, it's, a tough, it's tough to get that many split-ticket voters if most people are going to vote for the same party for president, senate, especially all federal offices. So I have a range there that's just sort of uh, based on we know that West Virginia is going to flip. So there's your R plus one. And so I think for Democrats, probably the best they can hope for is that that's the only thing that changes. Because the other problem for Democrats is that they don't have any real offensive opportunities on this map. The only two that they could conceivably flip that are currently held by the GOP are Texas and Florida. Texas, uh, Blexus, Blue Texas, is a, a thing that Democrats are, are hoping will happen one day because if they do it, they will... Uh, be in a really good position if they're holding on to California uh, in terms of presidential politics. But Ted Cruz is favored to win re-election in Texas. Texas is probably still a little too Republican-leaning for a Democrat to win there. And Florida has probably become slightly more Republican-leaning than it used to be. And so Rick Scott, the incumbent there, 
uh, is probably more likely than not going to win re-election. Um, Democrats could make it interesting. I wouldn't rule out a surprise, but that just makes it really tough. So then it's kind of a question of Republicans maybe winning Montana, maybe winning Ohio. Maybe they pick off one more of those light blue states where mostly Democratic incumbents are running um, uh, that are all competitive states in the presidential level. Uh, but they're, Republicans are in a really good spot for the Senate. And the House, which I won't uh, go into, dear, dear Lord, seat by seat, um, but it's important to understand that most seats in the House <laughs> are pretty straightforwardly going from one party to the other. And there's a group of about 60 seats that are really highly contested. And those are the ones in the middle. This is sort of using those ratings. Like solid means almost certainly going one way, likely, pretty likely to go for one party. Lean, slightly leaning toward one and toss up. I think everybody knows what a toss up is. Um, and in this situation, we have also some redistricting that has happened in some states. Now, redistricting usually happens right after the census. So a lot of st every state redistricted that has more than one district before the 2022 election. But some other states have had court cases or other things that have led to further redistricting. And there are going to be some trades, essentially. Uh, Republicans in North Carolina were able to redistrict the map the way they wanted, and they're probably going to gain three to four seats in North Carolina. However, uh, court cases over racial gerrymandering in Alabama and Louisiana created two new seats that black Democrats will likely win in those places. And Democrats might also pick up a seat or two in New York because of redistricting there. And so you might end up with it being a wash. And then it's a question of what happens in all the states that didn't change their lines. And you have a number of highly contested, very close. And that's why the range there, D plus five to R plus five, is sort of the feeling that it's going to be a tight race. Now, that could shift depending on, in part, what happens at the top of the ticket, because that's going to influence. Like, if somebody outperforms what we're you know, currently seeing, like Harris does a lot better or Trump does a lot better, that could have down-ticket ramifications because, again, most people are going to vote for the same party up and down the ballot. Um, so with that, I'm done. Happy to take any questions you have. Um, if you want to read more of my stuff and my colleagues, uh, abcnews.com or .go.com slash 538, the numbers. And again, that's the number of votes in the Electoral College. Uh, so thank you so much for having me. Uh, yes, sir. Well, she didn't have a majority, but she had, I think, what, 48 percent, and Trump had like 46.2 or something like that. So she had, she had a plurality of the of the popular vote. Yes. Um, so that that is an example of. I mean, we also saw that in 2000, Al Gore narrowly won the popular vote, but but George W. Bush won the Electoral College because Florida was decided by 537 votes, um, very very close. And so those, it's those two plus. Um, it's a little more complicated to talk about the other two. They call it a misfire. It's kind of the terminology of when the popular vote winner doesn't win the Electoral College. Um, and uh, the other two instances of that are in the late 19th century, um, although I think that's a little bit of a more difficult comparison because there's a lot of things like <laughs> it wasn't, you could, weren't free and freer elections in every state in the late 19th century, um, so not as easy of a comparison. Um, but in 2000 and 2016, the popular vote winner uh, lost in the Electoral College. Um, and that could certainly happen again. I mean, if, if we think about like the 538 forecast, we give Harris, I think right now, about a two and three shot of winning the popular vote, but only like a three and five shot of winning the election. Because right now, and this is also not a thing that has been constant by any means, the Electoral College is slightly more favorable to the Republicans because the makeup of the states that are most highly contested are slightly to the right of the country as a whole. So, for instance, in in uh, in uh, 2020, uh, Wisconsin was the tipping point state that put Joe Biden over the top, but he won it by four tenths of a point, while winning nationally by four and a half. So, yeah, so like that put the country about four points to the right of uh, like the Electoral College was like four points to the right of the country. Um, so. That has not been a consistent thing, though. To be clear, when Obama won in 2012, the Electoral College was actually somewhat more Democratic leaning um, because Obama, the, the state that put Obama over the top was actually slightly to the left 
of the country as a whole. Yeah? Do you never see any commentators talking about the fact that you could have, a, well, really specifically saying you could have a first woman president? But I dare say that there's definitely a certain, there's going to be definitely bias. People would not want a woman as a president. I think that is. Uh, I mean, after the 2016 example, and I think a lot of the studies that came out of Hillary Clinton's candidacy in 2016, that um, there is certainly some degree of latent sexism in, in our politics. However, I would say that one of the complicating factors there is that I think more than ever, those sentiments are politically aligned as well, such that you would expect most people who hold that position wouldn't vote for a Democrat anyway, regardless of who the Democrat was. And that might be something that, you know, I don't know if that's necessarily to Harris's advantage. I just think it's, it's, it's a situation where I think more than ever, if that's part of someone's thinking, and to be clear, this doesn't necessarily have to be a conscious thought, right? Like, this, it's not like someone's necessarily like, I don't want a woman. It might just, but it might be something that's a part of why they hold the particular set of worldviews they hold. But that person's probably a Republican-leaning voter at this point. Um, so that's like another, I think, thing worth keeping in mind. And I do think actually that the, if you look at how Kamala Harris has campaigned, it is very evident that the example of Hillary Clinton has been sort of taken to heart, um, or at least her campaign has clearly looked at what the Clinton campaign did and chosen to do some things differently. Harris basically never talks about the history-making potential of her candidacy. Um, Clinton's campaign slogan was, I'm with her which has gone down as one of the worst campaign slogans like in U.S. history. Usually you want your campaign slogan to be about, I don't know, the country, the voters, the people. Um, that was not Clinton's, and in hindsight, hindsight being 2020, of course, uh, maybe was not the best. And it spoke to that history-making potential, of course, for Hillary Clinton, right? Harris shies away from it. She hardly ever talks about it. She'll kind of nod about it when asked about it in, in interviews and whatnot, but she's, she's trying to shy away from that because I think she, from the Clinton example, she doesn't want to lean into that because she's like, that's taking away from perhaps other ways that I can message and try to make my case against my opponent. And that, that if, I, if I seem like that's what I'm running on, that like maybe that plays into certain, certain assumptions and stereotypes that people might have. Uh, and so avoiding that might be politically wiser. At the very least, it seems like that's the lesson they've taken. Yes, Angie. Are there any movements to dismantle the Electoral College that we should keep our eye on? Yes. Um, there, that yeah, so there is um, – I'm just going to shift back to the Electoral College. Um, there is something called the uh, National, National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, which is an ongoing effort at the state level to use a – little used, in fact, I don't think it's ever been technically used, part of the U.S. Constitution that allows for states to form interstate compacts to come to agreements about certain things, um, to essentially do an end around of the Electoral College, whereby you get, if you could get enough states that have a majority in the Electoral College, so at least 270 electoral votes, if you got the state legislatures to sign into law in those states, well, the governor sign in laws passed by the state legislature, or passed by, you know, popular referendum or what have you, depending on how each state's particular rules work, uh, a rule that says all the electoral votes that we have will have to go to the national popular vote winner. So not the person who wins your state, but rather change your state rules so they would go to that. The, mo the way that this interstate compact works, in theory at least, and the way it's written, is that they would have uh, the moment you get to a majority of, of electoral votes, like enough states that have a majority in the electoral college to have passed such laws, that it would then become active. And then that would as a, essentially be an end around. Because at the end of the day, states choose how they apportion their electoral votes. Um, states did not always do winner take all, uh, for instance. Uh, there used to be, um, uh, it, it's varied a lot over time. Like early, early 19th century, uh, the Electoral College, uh, as like some states were popularly electing them, others were having like the governor appoint them, and it was, it was you know, you slowly but surely you work toward the system we have today where the electoral votes reflect like the popular vote outcome in those states. But the Electoral College is malleable uh, in that way because the states have control over the appointment of electors and how that's done. I will say that if that were to come into play – 
uh, it would probably be a gigantic legal mess. And there's a lot of there are a lot of law articles that have already been written in pro or con of that. Um, so I think if you want to get rid of the Electoral College, the safest but still most difficult way of doing it is to have a constitutional amendment that, that gets rid of it. Um, there are other challenges to that that I think sometimes when people talk about this, they don't really get into, which is that we have 50 states in D.C. all using different voting systems. And so there would have to be some greater alignment of voting, uh, you know, voting technology, voting, voting apparatus, uh, like how the voting rules work in each state. Um, because, you know, there, there are various factors, but I can tell you that having like all mail-in vote in Washington makes it easier to vote there than in, say, Alabama. And while there are other things that play into the fact that those states have different degrees of turnout, you know, you'll have 80% of people show up to vote, basically, of the eligible pop, uh, electorate in Washington, but like 60% in Alabama. And it's, you know, the ability to vote. Now, it's not that mail-in voting automatically makes it like easier. I'm just saying that you would want some sort of a al better alignment state to state, I think, in order for a national popular vote to have true validity. Because right now, it, 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 I think it still has validity, but I just think that it would be better, it would, it would feel more legitimate if you had a better alignment of rules from state to state. But of course that involves federalizing uh, a, a very federal process, and that of course is uh, a challenge in our system. You know, I mean, I think it, it's, Trump is very, I mean, he's, it, it's interesting. There's a lot of debate over Donald Trump and whether he's like the problem or something, or is he the symptom? Or is he just like the loudest symptom possible of like a larger problem uh, in our politics? And I think Trump in some ways is a symptom of, a general, uh, like an increasing lack of trust in institutions, a lack of, uh, like increased alienation, of differentiation, of isolation, um, and, and splits over things like education and sort of your cultural worldview. Um, it's less about economics than it used to be. Um, the divides in our politics, a lot of it's very, very much based on social views. Uh, and, and it's not always that simple, but, you know, you can look at, like, what, you know, right-wing influencers are talking about Twitter. They're not talking about the tax rate, you know. Uh, that's not, they're, they're focused on LGBT, you know, LGBTQ things and uh, people, I don't know, cross-dressing or what have you. And people on the left are focused on uh, voting rights and, and fighting back against, I don't know, uh, Republican efforts to, to change voting rules in places like Georgia or what have you, and also, uh, uh, you know, pushing for, for trans rights and things like that. And it's like, there's just, like, you know, there's talk about the tax rate and there's talk about, like, economic stuff, but I think the, the really what I what really want to get to at here is that there is a definite alignment increasingly between just how people live their lives, like all the choices they make about their lives and their politics. And those things align more and more um, so that it's like, there isn't just like politics, like everything is politics. Um, and that, I think in that environment, a disruptive force like Trump, who I think speaks to a lot of people who are very unhappy with what they feel like is a high rate of change in our society, um, I think he speaks to them. And this lack of trust in institutions, um, I, I mean, not to say that plenty of people on the left don't have distrust in institutions too, of course, but it is interesting. The way the parties have shifted is that the Democrats have, have essentially become the party of government and the Republicans have become the party of not government. Um, and while that sounds like the traditional question of big government versus small government, it's not really about that anymore because actually Republicans increasingly are supportive of certain elements of big government if it brings about the social ends that they want. 
Um, and so that's, that's a big difference uh, in terms of thinking about like the parties and why someone like Trump is, is very appealing to a large segment of the public. Yeah, I mean, I think with the debates, the, it, is, it is worth remembering that a lot of people are just watching to cheerlead, you know? Like, it is true that, that polling suggested that more people thought Harris did well. But, you know, you can say, to, to put like a sports analogy on this, you can say the other team played well, but that doesn't mean you're cheering for them, you know? You, <laughs> um, and there definitely is like a team aspect, a tribal aspect to our politics that gets, that, that's also happened, which... Why you don't have a lot of people vote and split ticket? Because if you're a Democrat, you increasingly have a very negative view of Republicans. You might not even have that much of a positive view of Democrats, but you have such, like Republicans are so, like, they're just anathema that you can't imagine voting for one. And the flip side, Republicans like, I could never vote for a Democrat in a million years. Um, even if I am, like, displeased with elements of the Republican Party, I don't like Mitch McConnell or whatever. That like, could be a very common sentiment, but you would never vote for a Democrat. Like, I could never vote for a Democrat. And that just that sentiment is is uh, very strong. It's called um, negative partisanship, and this is something that we that political scientists have observed in the last twenty years or so. Is that those negative that negative affect negative emotion toward the other party has increased markedly, such that and that of course makes it even less likely that you would consider splitting your ticket. And I think a big part of that is that people view the parties as very different. Um, there was it George Wallace who said something like, you know, uh, oh my gosh, I don't remember the quote. Of course, I don't remember the quote right now, and I've used it a million times. But essentially, it was like it was like Twiddle D and tw Tweedle D and Tweedle Dumb. That's what he called them, like Democrats and Republicans uh, back in the '60s. That's he claimed that they were, the parties were like that different, right? Not different, but very few people view it that way now. Um, polls show that like. 80% of people notice at least somewhat substantive differences between the political parties and like a majority will say like they're very different. Um, so that means that there are even people who aren't very politically engaged who just know that the parties aren't, like that there are significant differences between the parties. And when you have such clear significant differences between the parties, that makes it also more difficult to imagine voting for the other party. And push, shifts you toward one camp, it's polarizing, you know, it makes it harder to potentially Okay. Right. Sure. Uh, yes, sir. Given where we are in the how did Obama do it? Well, I think I think um, well, 2008 election, you had a giant fiscal calamity. Um, I think that definitely helped Obama a lot. Um, I think any person with a D by their name would have won in 2008. Uh, apologies to John McCain, but that was turning into, as it per turned out, an extremely hard election to win as a Republican. Um, beyond that, though, I think Obama also did a good job of uh, turning out low, lower propensity voters. Um, and I think there is a case to be made that there were some voters who showed up for Donald Trump who were not voting in those elections. Um, there's a conversation about a group of voters, particularly white voters, without a four-year college degree in places like Ohio uh, and whatnot, who did not turn out to vote at all in 2008 or 2012, but did vote in 2016 and definitely voted in 2020. 2020, we had the highest turnout in an election basically ever. Uh, well, since the 19th century, um, which is, you know, as a valid comparison point, since like 1972, the 2020 election had the highest turnout of any election. So two thirds of people who were eligible to vote. That doesn't necessarily mean they registered, but were eligible to register and vote, voted. And that was the highest turnout we've had in a, any election, national election um, uh, since the voting age was lowered to 18 before the 1972 election. Uh, yes? Given the polarization you're talking about, is it going to be a losing proposition for Harris to be reaching out to moderates and some Republican, which she's been doing lately? So there's a, there is a, a little bit of an irony here in that things are very polarized, but people still like bipartisan talk. People still like to hear it. They like to hear references to it. Um, and uh, because people like to think they're more bipartisan than they are. In fact, that's why a lot of people say they're independent, but then very few people are actually functionally independent because almost all of them vote usually one way or the other and consistently 
you know, someone who's an independent who leans Democratic, they're probably voting Democratic like 95% of the time. You know, like they're not, they're, they're voting almost at the same rate for Democrats that an out and out Democrat is voting, and vice versa on the Republican side. Yeah, is that just because there are no options? Yeah, perhaps in part, but at the same time, that's also the situation that they have in front of them. And if they had any interest in like, being more independent, you would expect them, perhaps, if they were sort of living up to that nomenclature, to swing a little bit more than they do. And there just aren't that many swing voters. However, because things are, if we lived in a world where one party had kind of a clear edge, but things were polarized, like the party in the minority would be in a lot of trouble. Um, but because things are pretty, pretty close to evenly divided, at least especially in the context of like the Electoral College and the US House, um, pretty evenly divided, the small subset of voters who actually are swing voters, who actually might consider switching sides, are actually very important. Um, so persuasion still has like an important place in our elections. It's just that there's kind of a smaller group in the middle there that you're fighting over. But with the margins we're talking about, they're still really important, um, especially if they kind of swing more one way than the other. Um, so I don't want to discount, like turnout's really important. Like turning out your base is like, obviously massively important, but there's still definitely a place for persuasion. Uh, and that's like a smart approach. We saw it actually in the 2022 midterms. Look, you had an unpopular Democratic president in the White House. That should have been a really good cycle for Republicans, and it wasn't. They got narrow control of the House, sure, but they way underperformed where they should have been uh, based on historical position of where Biden was. And it's because at the end of the day, a lot of people who somewhat disapproved of Joe Biden voted Democratic in their local like U.S. House race, or for governor. Even though turnout, we have this, this idea that in a midterm election, which has lower turnout than a presidential election, you have this, this idea called differential turnout, where usually the party that's not in the White House, they're more likely to turn out. So like you would expect more Republicans to show up in 2022 relative to, say, the 2020 election. Like in terms of like proportions of the electorate, you'd expect more Republicans in 2022 because there's a Democrat in the White House, especially an unpopular Democrat. Just like in 2018, where Democrats showed up because there wasn't a popular Republican in the White House. But even with that differential turnout, Democrats did quite well in a lot of places. And they won over some people who, at least in name, in places like Arizona, were registered Republicans. They might not be Republicans anymore, though. Party registration, that's a lagging indicator because people are sometimes are slow to change which party they're registered with, even if they've already kind of shifted where they stand. Um, but, you know, they narrowly won in states like Arizona for governor and Senate. Uh, even though it, in theory, should have been an environment that was more favorable to the GOP. And I think that's where persuasion and where an issue like abortion is a really big deal because there are some people who are dissatisfied with the status quo, dissatisfied with President Joe Biden, but do not like the Republicans' views on social issues. And that, if you're thinking about like the case that Harris is making to voters, there's a reason why abortion is out front and center because it is clearly an issue where Trump's position is very unpopular. Thank you. And Jeff will still be here for a few more minutes. Yeah. So yeah. even though the presentation is ending, if you have a burning question, come up and elbow him. I'm sure he'll answer it. Um, the museum is open until 4 o'clock, so you have half an hour if you wanted to take a look at a few of the exhibits, shop in the gift shop, or ask Tom at the front desk any questions. He's heard them all. So he can probably answer it for you. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you. Thank you.